Hi, we're back. Um, we, we just gave up on my laptop. Um, so I'm Leah, and this semester I was doing genetic programming research with Professor Helmuth, and we were um, combining two relatively new genetic programming techniques, uh, lexicase selection, which Alex just introduced, and also novelty search. Um, so first of all, I'm also going to introduce genetic programming in my own words, um, probably a little faster since you kind of know it. Um, I'm also going to spend a little bit of time introducing lexicase selection and also novelty search, talking about how I combined them and then talking about what we found. Um, so first of all, what is genetic programming? Um, so it's, like Alex said, it's a type of artificial intelligence where uh, the human provides input output test cases um, and then the genetic programming system designs a, or develops, evolves a program to do these test cases um, for you. And so, uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. Um, and so what we were doing with our research was we had um, program synthesis benchmark problems um, developed by Professor Helmuth and I believe also Lee Spector, yeah. Um, and so these were problems that were trying to emulate the creation of 110 level code. Um, so for, um, so some of the um, problems that we did were replace space with new line, which just takes a string and outputs the string where all the spaces are now new line characters, um, and also calculate a Scrabble score, which is um, more difficult. Um, so uh, we, in our experiments, used 10 benchmark problems with varying difficulty and varying input-output data types. Uh, and one example that I thought I would go a little bit more into is mirror image, which was a relatively easy um, problem. It, uh, took in two, uh, two vectors and determined whether or not they were mirror images of each other. So I put two test cases up here. So the first one input is 11012 for in the first vector and the second vector is 21011, which as you can see is a mirror image of itself, or they're mirror images of each other and so we would expect true as the output. Um, and then the second one is not a mirror image. It's 12340 and 12326. They don't even have all the same uh, data values, so these are definitely not mirror images of each other. So we would provide a bunch of test cases just like this um, with uh, input and then expected outputs, and our programs are going to run on the inputs and try and create the correct outputs. Um, so how does genetic programming actually work? Um, so Alex talked about this a little bit. We first initialize, we make a bunch of random programs, and then we determine how good they are, how fit they are. Um, and from there, we, uh, where's the light? Okay, and, um, and so first we determine how good they are and then we select parents that are pretty fit and then from there we change them a little bit so that we're not just uh, like uh, continuing the same copies of the same program uh, over time. We edit them a little bit and then create a new population. Or if we find a program that does what we want, then we stop, or we also have a max number of generations that we run so we don't just run forever. Um, and so what we uh, experimented with is these two parts of the genetic programming loop, fitness evaluation, and parent selection. Um, so with parent selection, we used uh, lexicase selection, and then novelty search uh, affected how we did our fitness evaluation. Um, so first I'm gonna introduce tournament selection, which uh, we used as a comparison when talking about the, um, when we were looking at how well our method did, and it's also kind of the original vanilla way of doing genetic programming. Um, so in tournament selection, uh, the error evaluation is, or in error evaluation, we're calculating the aggregate fitness error of a program. So what this means is, um, I did an example up here where we're doing, we're trying to get a program that does x minus one, very complicated. Um, and so here are test cases. We're putting in one, two, and four, and here are the expected outputs, as you would expect, zero, one, and three. Um, program one is not very intelligent yet. It just outputs one all the time. Um, so what we do first is we calculate the fitness error on each test case, and then we sum it up to get the aggregate fitness error for that individual. Um, so in this case, in this, for the first test case, we have a fitness error of one. The second one, we happen to be right, and so we got zero. Uh, the best we can do um, for fitness error. And then on the third one, we had uh, two for our fitness error. And so then programs one, program one's aggregate fitness error is three. 
Um, in tournament selection, we then, because we're selecting parents, um, we kind of, uh, Professor Helmuth mentioned this a little bit when we were answering questions, we don't want to select the same parent all the time. So in tournament selection, the way we, uh, the way we uh, kind of filter down, uh, so that, or the way we uh, force ourselves to choose different parents at different times is we choose N individuals from the program, or from the population randomly, and then choose the most fit out of those to be our parent. Um, so in this example, uh, I said N is two, and we'll say that we have five programs. And randomly, we choose program one and program three, and I'm just telling you program three has an aggregate error of five. So between the two, program one has an aggregate error of three, program three has an aggregate error of five, program one's aggregate error is smaller. So we'll choose program one as our parent in that situation. But if we had program five, um, whose aggregate error was one, and program one, and those were the two randomly chosen programs, then we would have chosen program five to be our parent instead. Um, yeah, so that's tournament selection. So that's kind of the vanilla, basic, uh, very common genetic programming um, method. Uh, what we actually used in our research is lexicase selection, which Alex already introduced, so I'm going to try and go through this a little bit faster. Um, so lexicase selection, uh, Alex used some really good terms in his presentation, generalist versus uh, specialist. So tournament selection obviously is choosing generalists because you're using the sum, so you don't see actually if you do really well on specific test cases. All you know is how well you do overall. Um, but in lexicase selection, you're looking at each test case individually, so you can look and select, uh, you select programs that do really well on specific test cases. Um, so in this example, uh, let's say that we're, we randomly choose to filter by test case A first. Um, in that case, we're going to choose uh, individual one. And these are just uh, error values that I made up for the purpose of this example. Um, and then, if we chose uh, B, we filter down and we have two left over, so then we would choose another random test, we would randomly choose one of the other two test cases and uh, select a parent based on superior performance on that test case. Um, and then if we choose test case C, then we select uh, individual two to be the parent. Um, here's pseudocode, it looks very similar to Alex's. Um, it basically does what I just said. Uh, you start with the candidates being the entire population, and then you filter down based on a randomly selected test case. You choose, you, uh, the candidates become the programs that did best on that specific test case. And then you continue until you only have one individual left, in which case you, that individual is not your new parent, or you run out of test cases, in which case all of the, the candidates that you have remaining did exactly the same, and so it doesn't really matter which one you pick. Um, so that's lexicase selection. So that's half of what we kind of smushed together in our research. So the other half is novelty search. So um, in both of the uh, selection methods I just talked about, we're using fitness scores to kind of narrow down on more and more fit areas of the search space, which is just all of the programs that uh, the genetic programming system could possibly make. That's the search space. Um, so uh, in, with lexicase selection and Tournament selection, we're narrowing down. Novelty, the idea behind novelty search was to explore as much of the search space as possible. Um, so rather than narrowing down on a specific area, we're trying to explore areas that we have never looked at before. Um, so this was kind of developed and is uh, very effective on, pro, on problems with uh, deceptive fitness landscapes. Um, so uh, this problem, this maze problem, is really common in uh, novelty search literature. Um, so we have a starting point down here and we have a target point and fitness is determined by how close you are at the end of your run to the target point. Um, so with that in mind, uh, when if you're selecting for more and more fit individuals, you're gonna end up with a lot of programs that just do this, right? They go as fast as they can towards the target and then they hit a wall, but they're pretty close. Right, like you're not gonna get programs that end up over here. Those are not gonna keep, uh, they're not gonna propagate, they're not gonna be selected um, because they're not very fit. But that's what you want. You want pro programs that initially go down in a way because that's, those are the ones that have, um, that could potentially reach a solution. So a deceptive fitness landscape is where promising looking programs based on fitness actually will not lead to solutions. 
um, because they get stuck. And so that's what novelty search is really good at. Um, novelty search, uh, the idea is that if you have a lot of programs doing this, you're gonna select this one. You're gonna do what is most novel, what's most different. You're gonna select those programs to be the parents. Um, so uh, in order to do this, we look at the program's behavior vectors, which is the outputs uh, of all, on all the test cases. So it's just a list of all the, all the program's outputs on the test cases. And in order to determine the most novel, we find the distance to the K closest neighbors. So how far is it to the nearest things to it in the search space, basically. And so in order to do this, um, you have to do uh, vector differences, which get very computationally expensive and are really slow. And so that is relevant a little bit later. Um, so that's the basic, t the basic idea behind novelty search, is you're looking for programs that have done things that nobody else has done before. So what did we actually do? Um, so we did, we combined novelty search and lexicase, but the way we implemented novelty search was a little bit different. Um, we decided not to do the distance thing, partially because it was hard and slow. Um, and what we did was we did, um, we just did uh, equivalence uh, uh, calculations. So instead of finding the distance, uh, we did um, the, the number of times an output shows up. So here we have a program that outputs the names of our presenters today. Um, and we don't care what the actual answer is, what the expected output is, because we're not doing, we're completely ignoring fitness. In novelty, fitness is not taken into account, not taken into consideration at all. Um, so in this case, we're going to, we wanna calculate novelty on, for these three different test cases. Um, and so uh, for, I'm just gonna walk us through calculating uh, for individual one. So we wanna know how many times Paul shows up as an output for test case A. And we see that it shows up twice. So for individual one, uh, the novelty for test case A is two because Paul shows up twice. Um, for test case B, we wanna know how many times Alex shows up as an output for test case B. Um, and we see that again, it shows up twice. Um, so the novelty on test case B for individual one is also two. Um, for test case C, uh, we wanna know how many times Candace shows up as an output for test case C, and we see that it's only there once. So uh, the novelty for individual one on test case C is one. And so by doing this, we create a novelty error vector, which is just all these novelty per test case, like in a, in a list. And then we take, in our experiment, we take that and we take the fitness error vector, which we have to calculate, calculate anyway to determine if the program actually solves the problem. So we take those two vectors and we smush them together and make one gigantic error vector, um, which is a com combination of novelty errors and fitness errors. And then we use that for lexicase selection. Um, so in doing this, sometimes we will select individuals because they have good, they do well novelty-wise, sometimes they do well fitness-wise, and often they're going to do well on some combination of both. Um, and so in doing this, we're kind of, uh, the idea was to kind of target down on good areas while also uh, encouraging exploration of the search space. So to actually see how well this did, um, I'm, we called this method novelty lexicase selection. Um, very uh, creative, I know. Um, and so we compared novelty lexicase selection to lexicase selection on just fitness values, to novelty search, and to tournament selection on fitness values. And we did 100 runs on 10 of these program synthesis benchmark problems. Um, with each of these selection methods. And so the first, um, the first measure of success that we looked at was the success, success rates, which is just um, out of the 100 runs, how many produced a program that did what we wanted. Um, and so you probably noticed that Novelty Search does not have many of these results. That's because, um, because it does vector differences, it was just simply too slow to run on a lot of the problems. Um, as soon as we had vectors of strings or vectors of vectors, it became really, really slow and clunky and didn't really work. Um, so we ran novelty search on five problems, which you can see did not do as well as the other ones, generally. Um, in this case, it did better than tournament selection, but tournament selection did not do as well as novelty lexicase selection or tournament selection. Um, so in general, novelty search 
clearly did not do as well as the other, um, other methods. Um, novelty lexicase selection actually did very similarly to lexicase selection. Um, so there was one problem, the mirror image problem, where novelty lexicase um, selection uh, found the maximum number of uh, solutions it could find. It found 100 out of 100 runs. Um, and that was significantly better than lexicase selection. Um, and there was also one problem, syllables, uh, where novelty lexicase selection was significantly worse than lexicase selection. But for the most part, there was no significant difference in their, um, in their success rates over, all, over the 10 problems. Um, and then the second thing that we looked at was behavioral diversity. Um, so what that means is uh, how many of the, or what proportion of the programs in the population have a unique, um, have a unique uh, behavioral, have a unique behavior vector. Uh, so uh, they do something very different from, or they do something different from everybody else in the population. And so tournament selection is way down here at the bottom. Um, and it generally does not encourage behavioral diversity. Lexicase selection does pretty well. It's around 80%. And then novelty lexicase selection was actually up here at 90%. And this was on the syllables problem, which is the one where um, novelty lexicase selection did significantly worse than lexicase selection. But its behavioral diversity was still higher than that of lexicase. Um, and then here we also can see um, how novelty search did in comparison to the other problems. Um, and novelty search is this dark red line uh, right there. And then le novelty lexicase selection is the one right above it. So, in terms of behavioral diversity, novelty lexicase selection performed very similar to novelty search, but novelty lexicase selection could be run on a lot more uh, problems, and also it um, uh, and also it had a lot more uh, solutions found. It, um, in terms of solutions, it behaved a lot more like lexicase selection. Um, so what this means is that uh, novelty lexicase lexicase selection explored a lot more of the search area, of uh, the search space than lexicase selection did, but it was much better at honing down on um, successful and useful parts of the search space than novelty search was, which just kind of looks um, more at random. Um, yeah, and um, one thing that we did find was that, um, or one thing that we hypothesize is that if we do allow um, these, uh, pro these methods to run longer, we suspect that novelty lexi lexicase selection will continue to find more solutions while lexicase selection will not because uh, lexicase selection narrows down on parts of the search space while um, novelty lexicase selection would continue to look at different parts of the search space. Um, so that would be something that we, um, if we get to continue with this research, research we'll uh, likely look at. Yeah. Um, I would like to thank <coughs> Professor Helmuth for all his help and guidance over the semester. Um, and also thank Steve Young for help with the HPC, which we would not have been able to do anything without. Um, 